now we're going to hear from Melody and April. And they have uh, updated the Apple II environment intended to introduce today's kids to 1980s computing with the rough edges filed down and sparklers applied. Thank you both. Hello, so I'm Melody Ayers Griffiths, and this is my wife, April Ayers Griffiths, and our project is Percolate. Um, so a bit of background on it. We, I have a background as a computer technician, and April has a background as a software developer. And um, I guess one of our bugbears is that we both grew up in the 80s where there was a lot of exposure to um, early computing and early electronics and that sort of thing. And we were both kind of poor. <laughs> both of our families were, weren't very well off. Mine in Canada, hers in Australia. And, and so as a result, we basically had to hack together much of our own electronics. So, and write our own programs and games and that sort of thing. And that gave us an education and an understanding through experience into, into how computers worked and, and how programming worked and, and so on and so forth. Because even if one was just typing in something from a magazine, of course, you know, inevitably you had to debug it because, well, they were almost always had something wrong with them. So, so um, yeah, so we, we, we felt that that experience was missing, or at least the experience with a more rudimentary programming environment, because it's, it's one thing to take um, a kid and put them you know, in front of Scratch or something like that on a modern computer system, but there's so many layers of abstraction between, between Scratch and the hardware that you may as well be writing instructions to like a recipe or you know instructions as to how to you know drive across town because because that's really the substance of most of what you're accomplishing. However, the classic 8-bit environments are not what anybody would consider to be user friendly in a modern context. I mean, there's a certain expectation amongst modern kids that the, I guess the, 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 um, the learning curve isn't going to be that high, or at least there's not going to be a lot of interference from having to deal with a clunky interface or, or, or you know, other obstacles. So we sought to remove those, but the only way to really remove them was to essentially re-implement the environment from scratch. So that meant essentially rewriting basic, which we did. We did initially with, a, with a, something we released called Disco Runner, which was written in Java. And Disco Runner basically provided an AppleSoft and integer basic environment and um, came with a whole whack of programs built into it. And so it did OK. I mean, it did several thousand downloads. So we, we decided that since there did appear to be an interest in um, a project like that, that we would carry on to what we envisioned with Percolate. Now, I guess why the Apple II to start with? I mean, the Apple II has one of the largest basic software libraries that I could extract, you know, in, in part thanks to Jason Scott <laughs> um, for making all of that stuff available that one could actually go in and and rip all of those basic programs out of them and ingest them. So, so, and on top of that, AppleSoft Basic in particular is one of the most feature complete basics because as we all know, most 8-bit basics, you know, like on the Commodore 64, you pretty much, pretty much got to use poke commands for everything and, and it's not particularly um, user friendly. So we originally wrote Disco Runner in Java and then when we decided we wanted to do other things with it, we unfortunately realized that it was too slow. So, so we had to port to Go, where we decided on, we decided that Go with its multi-threading and that sort of thing was going to be best suited for our development <laughs> forward. So we ported it from Java to Go, which took a while and had a steep learning curve, but we got there. Um, so, yeah, so the idea for the overall platform is kind of a cross between a 1980s um, information service like Quantum Link and um, 
Uh, yeah, and, and the same thing, a reverse engineering of the 8-bit platforms to allow them to um, take advantage of modern functionality and um, exchange information and so on and so forth. So why don't we start going to a bit of a demo now? So we'll at least boot it up. Yep. So just press the up arrow and just press the green top left hand corner. Yeah. Not a back view though. <laughs> okay, so it is internet connected, it's server connected, so whenever you start up the application, it, it basically prompts you to log in to, to the server. Now, as you noticed, I mean, obviously, Apple IIs can't natively do that sort of thing. So, so there's a few notes here. One is an emulator, or when you're, you're emulating something, you actually have 32 by bits to play with in your byte. And, and, and since the, the Apple II only uses eight of them, then that gives you 24 to pack in all sorts of the all, all sorts of extra information. So in this case, we've packed in color, we've packed in font size, we've packed in extended character set, and so on and so forth. So, so well, whilst maintaining compa compatibility with the memory layout from the Apple II, so that was fun. <laughs> okay, so why do we go on? Yep. Do we go into floating point or no, go into, into run, run breakout? Okay. And you're going to have to... Oh, it's under... Um, yeah. yeah. That's Actually, right. let's do that first. Just go into cat. Yeah. So where Disco Runner had the files kind of packed into the executable, we've actually put them online. So this is a cloud server. And, and, and you know, I have a home directory that's got currently got several thousand things in it because I've been happily <laughs> ripping stuff out of, out of things. But, but if we go into the software directory, so the currently sort of organized software directory has about a thousand basic programs available in it. So here we can go find breakout. And they have descriptions. So so this catalog this catalog is, you know, obviously once again we're looking at more user friendly, you know, easy to access. If the software is available, it's there. There's no messing about with having to go get a disk image and load it and then like go on to the next one. You can just Go ahead and run it. Okay, so here we have breakout. Now, uh, this is rendered in OpenGL, so so we have glowy pixels. Okay. But we also have the ability to move the model in 3D space. So let's move the model around a bit. So the so the graphics layers are presented as OpenGL and and um, they can be moved separately. We've got an independent graphics camera and what we call the HUD camera, which is where the text layer sits. Yeah, can those be controlled programmatically or is that yes? Uh, yep, they can. Yeah. It's just something you're doing to keep your interface as a as a and vice versa. Yeah, okay. they can be controlled programmatically. So let's have a look at next list and edit. Okay. <coughs> yep. So I'll break out. Okay. So a few other enhancements that we've made, just to take a quick look, is one is an X list, and so that allows that allows one to view the programs in a more organized format, so it's not all stacked up. We we do have a we do have a, an enhancement in progress that will actually renumber the programs entirely, but we're still working on that one. Uh, we had to cheat a little bit and implement else in order to kind of make that work, but it's not. It's not working 100% yet, so you can you can take a look at it, and it's it's color coded, so it's fairly 
easy to, to browse and that sort of thing, and then to edit it. And we, we do actually have an editor that also breaks them out. It's not color coded, but it breaks it out. And so then you can happily insert and edit lines and that sort of thing. And then when you, when you exit back out, it, it repacks it back into memory the way a normal Applesoft basic or yeah, integer so basic I, program I is it packed. And then go control X, it'll ask me if I want to save the changes. Hit yes, you're back at the prompt that's changed. Yeah, yeah and uh, history. So, and then another one that we thought was, was quite useful was the ability to just press up in order to, to scroll back through the Any history. fans of Unix shell will love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one thing I like to do is I'll just I'll just type list and then the line number. And then and then we store we store the last number that you list in, in the actual in, in, in the, the buffer, buffer. So, yeah. then, so then you can just press up and then you can just then use then the cursor keys oh, okay. to, to move around and, and edit it and yeah, and then solve that, solve that problem. Right. So why don't we load up flap, new Flapple Bird, so it's Offset Bird, it's okay. called. That's no, just load it, right? Yeah. Uh, in the root of your account? Yeah. So in terms of like in terms of enhanced functionality, we have a function syntax. Actually, maybe just go to help first. Like just go to help. So yeah. in eighty column, maybe. Oh yeah, I'll do an eighty <laughs> column. Yeah, three. So we do have a we do have an enhanced function syntax. These are the functions that we currently have available. It's kind of disorganized in its layout, but but we've used the open angle or open. Um, Curly brace. curly brace and close curly brace to denote that it's a that these are functions and these actually provide enhanced abilities in terms of being able to play um, music or wave files or or um, move the camera around or control the CPU because because this isn't running on the CPU this is this is a go re implementation of the interpreter environment um, so so basic and Logo, we both re-implemented that way. We do, of course, have machine language. So, so first we'll list list the. So this is a stub, and, and it's what we need to do in order to actually load binaries because we don't really have a way to just you know inject the binaries in because we have to run the CPU emulator. So, so there's a few things here. We've we've got a shim for Prodos because we needed one for Plapplebird. Um, um, and then we've got commands that, that allow you to essentially offset the colors in OpenGL space and, and, and um, then there's a command to change the camera orbit so that it moves it offset a bit and then we load the Flapple bird and we execute it. So why don't we execute it? Well, we had to actually implement double GR just for this, so... <laughs> so. Actually, I should start that in... Um Oh, you saw another thing there. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's in that. So yeah, I'll just start it in. So then we have Flapple Bird, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is that we then choose which colors you can you can pick a color and then choose to offset it positive or negative in 3D space, and and that allows you to create that 3D effect. That and being able to move the camera around. So so that's that's kind of an interesting. Obviously, I don't play this very much. <laughs> and the pressure of the crowd. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Alright, so let's let's look at Pac-Man too. Like we may as well do that uh, now. Pac yeah, Miss pa it's <coughs> Miss Pac-Man right. enhanced. Okay. So this works this works to the same degree with HDR as well. So HDR, I mean the effect's not quite as pronounced, but you may as well start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably the other thing to note is you'll notice the colors are slightly different in this one as well. But you, you can actually redefine the, um, the, the palettes as well as offsetting them. Yeah. 
Yeah, so... So you'll have to restart it, I guess. And I can I can kind of keep talking a bit. So yeah, the broader I mean, this is the foundation that we've been working on of the broader system. They the 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 point, of course, is it's going to be built around that central um, sort of re-implementation of an online service. So so I'm, it's going to have the ability to exchange messages and do chat and. And, and, and forums and so on and so forth. So it's basically an attempt to create a community around writing programs, you know, for the Apple II or for you know the enhanced with the enhanced commands that we provide as part of the platform. And um, yeah, um, so let's have a look at the logo. Okay, so once again, we re-implemented Logo from scratch. And generally speaking, you would think that Logo is not, not, not all that interesting in a modern context, but it gets a lot better when you render it in OpenGL. <laughs> so, so let's do the, let's do the house thing. Well, actually, let's do the hamster wheel thing. So just load hamster. All right, so run that. Oh, oops, you're going to have to edit it. Sorry. That's my fault. I changed something. It's set PC, isn't it? a common core that drives the interpreter and then a module that provides the, the syntax. Okay, so let's look at our look at our hamster wheel. <laughs> yeah, so we've added a few extra verbs to logo obviously. We've got up and down which kind of like pitch the turtle. Um, we've also got uh, roll left RL and roll right. So you can can uh, basically do that and you can also there's command a few commands to actually move the camera as well. So let's zoom in on it. Yeah, may as well zoom right through it. Why not? <laughs> All right, so you know and as of course of course as you notice we can use more than the stock you know, six colors that are available in HDR. We can, we, we, we can, we've packed the extra colors into that extra, you know, extra collection of bits in the 32-bit byte I was talking about earlier. So, so then you don't have that restriction, but yet, yet we are compatible with existing logo programs and we'll probably put in MIT and Terrapin logo as well in the not too distant future. So that, that compatibility is there. Um, one of the major selling points is that, is that it's easier to modify an existing program than it is to write a whole new one from scratch. But yet you still you still learn a fair amount from from tinkering, right? So this platform hopes to provide a, a fairly enticing avenue for tinkering with these programs, which of course we don't want to fade into obscurity. And this gives another avenue to remake them fresh again and you know get a whole new generation to have some experience with you know with this and and yeah hopefully learn some stuff from it um, so we've got one more demo 
what they like to do. Yeah, so it'll be available for Linux and Mac and um, Windows because it's written in Go, and we plan on writing a we plan on writing a player for Android and hopefully maybe even for iOS if they'll if they'll allow such a thing to exist. Um, I'm not sure about that one yet, but you know we'll see how we go. So. We do have a central server. It's a central VPS. I mean, we're, we're going to have to make that a bit of a broader network before we actually release this, which is hopefully going to be around Christmas. Um, but it also, the server also, allow, also hosts virtual instances of our interpreter. So what we can do is we can essentially clone our interpreter to the cloud service and then essentially other instances can connect to it. So April seems to be having a problem getting her yeah, control her controller working. So we always talk in the show just throwing a demo. Um, the interesting thing is uh, with the remote instance, essentially they share memory across the network. So we're actually syncing the memory um, over the network. But there's also some glue in there to say things like, okay, first player's April, she's paddle zero, so if I intercept the paddle zero memory out, say, stick them in the paddle zero address. Melody, on the other hand, <coughs> wanted to be paddle one, so her paddle zeros come through, remap them into the, the paddle one space. So <laughs> we tested this out this morning <coughs> with the working <coughs> So, so kids will be able to not only play the games against each other, play the action games against each other, but also things like, for example, text adventures. So, so you can load up a text adventure and then communally as a party of, you know, a number of, of online users essentially go through the text adventure and share that experience. Now, because, because all of these memory changes are actually being cycled over the network, we can also record them and play them back. So it's kind of like Twitch for 8-bit Twitch for computers. <laughs> so, 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 so we'll be able to make, it, make these, these, these you know, available for other users to actually play back and, and you know, watch these you know, adventuring or, 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 or competitions uh, against each other. That was the problem. I didn't actually switch over to using that one. I was still in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, but yes. So, so, the multiple users, and and, and honestly, I mean, the the number of users that we can have in any one in any one instance really just depends on on what the technology will handle, and and you know what sanity, what limit sanity actually. You know, permits. <laughs> so yeah, um, so that's about it for what we have to show off at the moment. I mean, we have a, it's a, an ongoing work in progress, and, and it's a hun, you know over a hundred thousand wine, hundred thousand unique wines of, of code right now. So so we're probably going to be. Uh, doubling that before we actually get to a release. But but um, when we do, then we're hoping that it'll get some traction and we'll be able to to, to revive revive these software libraries and and get them 
you know, in use and, and let kids, you know, upgrade them and, and, and they can live again. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Ah, yes? Uh, you mentioned, um, just, there, just there at the end, uh, I, I, I was just impressed. You had me at the very beginning with uh, all of it. But uh, the, uh, <laughs> you just mentioned at the very end having kids, uh, giving kids access to the software library and upgrading it. Yeah. Is there a um, like a shared document space or, or even like a personal storage space for users? We have, we have, each user has their own home folder. And we also have the, the concept of projects. So, so we have projects that are essentially communal spaces in which the project owner can actually assign other users that have access. Five people or something, and, and everybody everyone read access, but also people write access. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We do have. And then you have. I assume some sort of uh, storage space for the users. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we have metadata. Each, each, each file has metadata available to it. This is, I mean, we, we want younger kids to be able to use the system as well. So we're aware that, I mean, we're, go we, we're, we're going to have to institute a certain amount of content filtering and, and an approval process before, before, you know, kids can essentially, you know, or anybody for that matter. Because we want, we want mentors. I mean, we want older adults to be on the system too, acting as mentors. But, I mean, it, it will be a very monitored system. It has to out of necessity. Uh, um, um, yeah, so, so, so when somebody creates a program that they want to make publicly available, then it will go through a, it'll go through a screening process to make sure that it's, no. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Is there capability for local storage, like on your own? Yeah. 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 So there's a local folder. Um, so so um, I'm not sure if this is going to work or if it's going to break forward. But okay. No, it did actually work. So there is a local folder. Um, oh, because it's on the remote instance. <laughs> Great. Um, um, yeah. Anyway, there, there is um. When you log in, you'll see that you have a folder called local, and that actually maps to a satellite folder underneath your user directory. So in OS 10, it'll be usually local. On your own. Yeah, on your own computer. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we do have too is you can copy and paste, um, like if you need to find online and that kind of stuff, you would paste them into the editor or add prompts, and it will just give you the event. How would you, would you be able to get? I had a disk image of a software program that I wanted to run in this environment. Yeah, so one of the things we're actually looking at doing is adding uh, disk support. So that's kind of, kind of on the horizon. So we have like a modular um, file system architecture, so it's just a matter of writing and drive with a digital file format and then plugging it in. So that way, if there's a DSK, there's a DSK go in there like a folder and just send it back to the first file. So all the things that No, no. So, so, but I've been taking stuff out of DSKs and then, and then, um, sort of bringing them in. So you you end up essentially with a with a stub in order to run them. So if I say load Pitfall 2, right? There's a couple things here. One, we've got to say to turn the zero page on because, of course, our implementation of Basic doesn't itself like like do zero page. So. So we turn zero page on. We tell it mode is your one, which is basically use was mode because our our default HDR mode is linear, so that you can it's a lot it's easier to, to, to a layout, yeah. So then so then once you've done that, then it's ready to actually run. So then we deload it, and then we we call twenty forty five. You know, we call the address, and then 
and then you can actually, you know, play the game. And, I mean, it's all the same, sort of. I mean, it's still rendered in OpenGL space, so, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what the practicality is of playing like that, but, you know, you, you can if you want. So, uh, would there be a potential for the, the let's say, uh, you know, a school wanted to use this in a, you know, as a lab setting? Yeah. Is it possible, do they have the ability to, ideally, I, I'm, you know, just from experience talking to, to uh, you know, staff instructors uh, locally, they would like to ideally to be able to have the server run locally. Yes, yes, absolutely. We, 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 we will be making, we will be making uh, a server available, a standalone server available <laughs> to schools so that they can actually run it locally and have control over all of the content that's, that way they can that's on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It would be their own, their own students. They'd be able to, to monitor the content. And, and, and yeah, and hopefully, you know, assuming, assuming we work stuff out, then all, all of this mech software and that sort of thing will be available too. So. So once again, all of the educational stuff will be, you know, will get a chance to, to, to live on again as well. Yeah? Um, <coughs> I'll, post, I'll post something on the Kansas Fest mailing list so that you know, people, can, people can register their interest. And, and yeah, we were, hope, we're hoping to have a, have a beta version out probably September, somewhere in September. So, so yeah, anybody that's interested, definitely we we we, we need the help to to make sure it's a, a good product. Yes. Thank you very much for Flappy Bird. <laughs> One last thing, we both want to thank Mark Pilgrim who sponsored us coming here. And so round of applause for Mark. Thank you.